Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Northbridge. We're so glad to have you here this morning and online. We're going to sing some songs right now. If you all would stand and sing along with us, greet someone. All the words are going to be on the big screen and it's very easy to follow along. So we're going to get right started. Thank you.
Amen. Let's keep singing this morning, celebrating the fact that we all can be made new through Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hope, my
those words that we just sang, they're, they're simple, but they're so profound that our, our hope is only found in Jesus. It is found in Jesus. It's the reason that we gather this morning. It's the reason that we sing. And it's the reason that we can find hope and strength, not just for today, but for tomorrow as well. Because, well, in it through Jesus, God demonstrated that he's not against us. He is for us. He's so much for us that he sent his son so that we could find life, life now and a life abundant, but also the life yet to come. And we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. But before we go there, I invite you to pray with me right now. Father, I thank you for bringing us all together this morning. I thank you for the hope that is found in and through your son, Jesus. And uh, I thank you that through him, not only do we find hope, but we find strength for today. And, and hope for tomorrow as well, that you are for us, that you are not against us. So I know that in this room and online as well, there, there are so many circumstances that swirl around each and every one of us. I pray that you would meet us in the midst of those circumstances and that you would fill us with hope, the hope that is found in and through your son, Jesus. As we open up your word in just a moment and we look at the hope that can be found for today, but especially in the life that's yet to come, I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would bring up conversation amongst us, but I also pray that you would change us, that we would leave here more in love with you than when we walked through those doors just a few moments ago. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. You can take a seat. And uh, my name's James. Once again, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful October morning. Thanks for joining us online. We're kicking off a brand new series in a moment, and uh, we'll let you know more about that in just a few minutes. But before we go there, I want to let you know about some things that are going on around the church this season. One of them is next week, as you're well aware, it's Halloween week. And we like to have some extra fun with that. Um, we're not celebrating Halloween here as a church, but we do figure that many of those kids have costumes. And so we like like to have an extra fun Sunday, and that's going to be next Sunday. We call it the Mega Awesome Costume Party. So have the kids, the students, anybody down the hall right now come in next week, and they're not so scary costumes. That's the key phrase, not so scary, okay? It's an extra fun day, extra activities down there, and it's a fun day for us as they all come in, and they're just excited to show off their costumes, and they look so cute and funny, and so all that fun stuff. So that's going to be next week. So parents, grandparents, make note of that. Um, we also have a small group is kicking off. It's a short-term group. So if you were looking for something easy and accessible to try out, or maybe something to add to your current long-term group, it's going to be kicking off on November 8th. So you've got time to register. Registration's open now on our website and app. And it's called CORE. It's a group that I'm going to be leading. And what we're going to be talking about is how, you know, there's so much disagreement in our culture and world today, but some of the stuff that we shouldn't be disagreeing about, especially when it comes to followers of Jesus, are what are, the, what are those core beliefs that all followers of Jesus should hold to? Um, Regardless of your background in faith, you know, maybe you grew up a different denomination or maybe you have no background at all. We're going to be talking about what are the core beliefs that Jesus followers hold to? How do we apply those to our lives? But more importantly, how do we live them out in the world around us? So three weeks, it's an incredible conversation. So it's not just a class, it's a conversation. There's fun, um, you know, there, there is some teaching, um, but there's great opportunities to make friends and stuff as well. So you can register on our app or our website for that. It's going to be starting on Tuesday evening, November 8th. I look forward to seeing you there. I hope you'll join me. And um, we're also in this season of generosity. So if you missed net last week, we kicked off a season of generosity we call Be Rich. And we want to show the world around us that, that we are a church that gives and serves and loves our local and global nonprofit partners, that we are for them, just like Jesus was for us and did those very things for us. And so you gave financially last week. Incredible. If you missed that, you you can still be a part of it. Just look for this logo on our website or app that's up on the side screens or just click on the top three and you'll go right to a website that has a button where you can click to give. But this week we're talking about serving because it's not just about giving of our finances. It's about serving with our time. And so we have several opportunities that we want you to make note of and online you can participate in these as well. The first is we are going to have a food drive next week. So between now and next Sunday, please go root through your pants 
pantries or if you're out shopping, get some extra items. We're going to be partnering with our local food pantry here in Cranberry, Gleaner's Food Bank, and helping them stock their shelves. As you can imagine, there's a great need right now. As the cost of things rise, more and more people need assistance. And Gleaner's is just saying thank you in advance for the help that you're going to do. The items that you see on the screen are the items in most need. You can bring anything as long as it's not expired or glass, okay? Those are the two exceptions. Expired or glass, please don't bring those. But these are the items in most need. If you want to pull out your camera right now or take a screen grab at home if you're watching online. And online, I know in past food drives, so many of you have shipped food here. Um, Big boxes start to arrive this week and it's because you're online and you want to be a part of helping this effort. Thank you in advance for that. But next week, we'll collect all these items. So just bring them back with you on Sunday morning and then we'll distribute them for you to gleaners in the middle of the week. So next week, we're doing a big food drive. That's a way that we can serve. We also have a service project lined up for the middle of January. So I know it's way out there, um, but we want you to get it on your calendars. More than that, we want you to register today because space is limited. We only have 80 spots for everybody in the church and anybody 10 years old or up can serve. So a great family activity, student ministry activity, but really you know, a small group activity. If you're just here on your own and checking us out for the very first time, welcome. We're so glad to have you. If you want to be a part of something good, help us uh, help World Vision this coming January. Huge warehouse on the north side of the city. So many donated items and any people like us to help sort them so they can be shipped out for global distribution. So that's coming up. QR code. Also, if you look for that Be Rich logo, you'll be able to click on serve and sign up for that. But they aren't the only service opportunities. You're like, what else you got? Well, we got a lot because we have so many nonprofit partners here in the local area. They're represented on this screen and they can't necessarily host a service project for 80 of us, but they'd love to have eight of us right? I mean, they can, they can deal with that or they'd love to have one of you. So if you're talking about a small group, you know, whether an adult small group or even a student ministry small group or just your family or just you on your own, we're sending out an email this week that's going to list our local nonprofits, what they're all about and how you can directly contact their volunteer division. They would very much like you to serve alongside of them. In fact, they could use you in, in very tremendous ways. They're saying, please, please, please finance is help, but boots on the ground are even better. Come serve alongside our local Pittsburgh nonprofits and show them that you are for them uh, by your presence and by serving as Jesus has served us. So that's where we're going with serve this week. So keep an eye out on your email boxes. If you're, if you're not on our email list, um, you can stop by the guest service table before you leave. They'd love to get you signed up so you don't miss out on that this week. All right, speaking of generosity, we're going to move into a time of local giving. Instructions on how you can give are up on the screen. There's also a drop box at the back of the room. So thank you to those of you that consider this your, your home church, your local church. Thank you for giving and partnering with what God's doing in and through this church. And if you're new this morning, I just want you to know there's absolutely no expectation for you to give. In fact, we've got a gift for you. So if you haven't already, please stop by the guest service table. We'd love to meet you and get one of those gifts into your hands. Just our way of saying thank you for taking some time out of your Sunday morning. Thank you for figuring out how to get here. You know, they've told us in the past the roads are going to be closed and then it's not closed and then they didn't say anything this weekend and roads are closed. So thank you for getting here this morning. And uh, we hope that you'd have a great experience. As we take some time to give, we're going to uh, sync up with our partner churches. If you haven't been here before, when we're not speaking live and having a live message like we did over the past couple of weeks, we sync up with our partner churches for a live message together. And we're doing that this morning as Andy Stanley kicks off a brand new series entitled Heaven. And who goes there? So here's Andy. So the uh, story is told of a Sunday school teacher who wanted to explain to first graders um, what what somebody had to do in order to go to heaven. 
But in an attempt to find out what they already knew, he asked them a few questions. And so his first question was this. He said, hey, first graders, if I sold my house and my car and had a big garage sale and gave all the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And the children all said, no. He said, what about this? What if I cleaned the church, mowed the lawn and kept everything neat and tidy? Would that get me into heaven? And all the children said, no. He said, what about this? What if I'm kind to animals, give candy to children? Would that get me into heaven? The children said, no. He said, well then, how can I get into heaven? A little boy in the back of the room stood up and said, you gotta be dead. So today we're beginning a brand new series entitled Heaven, Who Goes There? Now, here's the thing, and you you know a lot of this. Most Americans believe in some version or some form of heaven. And of course, because we're Americans, um, and for those of you who aren't Americans, excuse us, but most of us are convinced we're going there. Um, and there's a lot of mystery, a lot of questions about you know how the whole thing works. But for the most part, most Americans believe in heaven and believe somehow um, that they're going to they're going to go there. They're absolutely confident, even though they can't explain it and answer all the questions. They're confident that somehow it's going to work out. But for now, I got to go work out, and for now, I got to go to work, and I got to raise my kids. I don't have a whole lot of time to think about this. But eventually, it's just going to work out. And for most people, especially the United States, there are two assumptions that drive this overwhelming sense of confidence that I don't have answers to all the questions, but I know it's somehow going to work out. And the two assumptions are, of course, number one <clears throat> is that good people go to heaven. And the second assumption is I'm a good person. So there's my formula. Um, good people go, bad people, who knows, but I'm busy and I know that good people go to heaven. And I'm a good person. Now I got, I got to go. I got stuff I got to do. Now, some Christians reject these assumptions. Um, some Christians actually embrace these assumptions based on, you know, or some mix of these assumptions. And, um, so I just thought, you know, since we're a church, we should, we should, talk about this. Now, there are several big advantages to this whole approach that, you know, the good people go to heaven and, and I'm a good person. The, the, the first advantage, and I think the reason this is just something that's easy to assume, is that it's, it's just. I mean, it's fair. I mean, good people, if there's an afterlife, and most people believe there's some sort of afterlife, good people should go to a good place if they've been good in, in their life. And, and generally speaking, everybody knows what's good and everybody knows what's bad. So we kind of have a, enough of an idea to know, you know, how we're doing if we're good people. And embedded, this is this whole idea is embedded in pretty much all world religions um, with some variations on the theme, obviously, and everybody can't be wrong. So it's understandable why this would catch on, why this would be an assumption. The, the second thing it has going for it is this, again, is that you make the cut <clears throat> because you're a good person. In fact, not only are you a good person compared to some people, you're amazing. Like you might be up at the front of the line because you've met some people who aren't near as good as you, right? Number three, it supports the notion of a good God. I mean, if there's a good God, a good God would want good people in heaven. If the, regardless of how you view that or how it works out, a good God would want to surround, fill or populate heaven with good people, people like you and people like me, I'm a good person. And then the other advantage of this, of course, that kind of drives this, and this is, this is sort of, sort of a, a backdoor um, reason why we, this could be true, is that the fear of not going to heaven should motivate people to be good. So there's, you know, there's a payoff in the end. There's a reason to be nice. There's a reason to be kind. There's a reason to sacrifice. There's a reason to put others first. There's some sense of accountability in this divine, cosmic, intangible, but real accountability, you know, lights up our conscience from time to time. And it's like, this is what I should do. This is what I ought to do. And as we talked about before there, we all have an internal sense of ought to, ought to, ought to, should do. And so if that is, you know, we certainly didn't make it up because it holds us accountable. So if that's from God and that's inside of us, then doing what we ought to, hey, then we should be rewarded for doing what we ought to. So be good, you know, and you'll go to a good place. But here's the problem. Here's why we're talking about this. Upon further examination, and not even further examination, upon even marginally close examination, if you scratch beneath the surface of this, the comforting veneer of, you know what, you're a good person, it's all gonna work out, we don't know the details, we can't answer all the questions, but it's gonna work out, good people go to heaven. Scratch beneath that very comforting veneer, and the whole thing really falls apart really, really quickly. And I would like to help it fall apart for as many of us 
as possible so that we'll think deeply about eternity and think deeply about what if there is an afterlife, to think deeply about what really, what is God like? But sometimes until we kind of punch through our assumptions, we don't take the time. We don't have the energy. We're not even that interested in figuring this stuff out. The good people go to heaven theory breaks down really quickly. There are some unsettling realities that when we focus on those, it causes maybe to just churn our thinking a little bit and maybe even bother us at the level of our conscience. And here's, here's the big one. Here's the real problem with the good people go to heaven uh, idea is that we have no indisputable, agreed upon, divinely revealed standard. I mean, we don't even really know what good is. Good is whatever you want good to be. Good is whatever I want good to be. But wait, if God is gonna let us into heaven based on us being good, then surely God would reveal to us what is good and what is not good and reveal it in such a way that we know where we are. But there is no multi-generational, remember, it's not just us. There's no multi-generational universal set of rules to, re- to measure ourselves against. And here, the thing is this, you know enough history to know this, that morality, justice, good over the course of human history, it's been all over the place, right? In fact, this is kind of a strange thought. You may disagree, but based on the current ethic, our current Western ethic, our current Western ethic regarding how women should be treated. I mean, you know, once upon a time, it wasn't this way, but now, you know, men and women, equal dignity and equal rights under the law, you know, you know, based on our current understanding of good and bad versus the equality of men and women, do you know what that means? It means that before the 20th century, maybe only a dozen men went to heaven. I thought that was kind of funny and kind of disturbing. It's like, yeah, I mean, think about it. If we, in other words, the, the, if we think about how women were treated, how women were viewed in previous generations, not just of our country, but, but in the world, and we're so indignant and, and rightfully so indignant about how women have been treated and how women have been viewed. I mean, how awful that was and how awful it is in other countries. Well, the goodness, I, not very many men before you know, we finally came to our senses and kind of wised up and matured about the dignity of women, maybe not many men went to heaven if only good people go to heaven. And ladies, before you get too excited, you know, based on the modern Western ethic regarding slavery, maybe nobody before the 16th century went to heaven except some slaves. Not just the people who owned slaves, but the people who thought, well, of course people have slaves. Certain people should own other people. Certain people were born to be owned. Other people were born to own. I mean, that was just common sense. It was self-evident. And what was self-evident in most of the world during most of the history of the world is so not self-evident to us. And we think that's terrible. Well, again, the, the point simply is this, that good is a moving target. It's a, it's a moving target culturally, it's a moving target generationally. It's a moving target nationally. And if we're honest, good is a moving target personally, right? I mean, what bothers you now didn't bother you a generation ago or excuse me, a season ago in your life or at an earlier time in your life that your whole sense of what's good and bad and right and wrong has changed over time. Now, of course, and maybe you're thinking this, um, many people, especially in the West, uh, immediately wanna say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we do have a standard for right and wrong. It's the Bible. I mean, that's the whole point of the Bible, isn't it? The Bible gives us a standard of good and bad and right and wrong so we know where we stand with God. But if your idea is to go to the Bible to find out what is good and bad and where you stand with God in terms of your, your behavior, I do not advise that. Because if the Bible is the standard of good and bad and you have to be that good in order to go to heaven, you do not make the cut. And I don't even know you, but I assure you, if that's your standard, you don't make the cut. Every once in a while, it's been a while because people don't like to talk to me about these things when they find out what I do. But um, in the past, before people knew, and you know, when I was kind of more of a normal person, I, people would, and I would have these conversations with people, they bring up the 10 commandments. And we're gonna talk about the 10 commandments, not next time, but in part three. They bring up the 10 commandments. Well, you know, I keep the 10 commandments or what about the 10 commandments? And, and what's so interesting, and I don't, you know, I, try, I don't wanna be snarky, but I, I have said to people, okay, well, what are they? I mean, this is what you live by. If this is the standard, if you think somehow keeping the 10 commandments will get you to heaven, name them, list them for me. Well, murder, I'm like, so don't murder. All right, what else you got? Um, and that's about it, don't steal. Yeah, okay, what else you got? I don't, I, don't, I don't know the 10 commandments, but I keep them. 
Oh, that's good. That's it. So your eternity, I mean, and again, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. The problem is the whole good people go to heaven thing, it breaks down really quickly when you start asking questions. Now, here's, here's a fun fact about Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about it again in a couple of weeks. The Ten Commandments is found in the Old Testament book of Exodus. In the Old Testament book of Exodus, where you find the Ten Commandments, the word heaven doesn't even appear. There is no correlation, there is no linkage to the 10 commandments or any of the law of God given to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament in heaven. I mean, the Old Testament pretty much ignores issues of eternity. That's not what the Old Testament, or excuse me, that's not what the 10 commandments were about. There's no connection. Now you may have made a connection and a lot of people have made a connection, but if you read it in context, there's no connection. Now. Unlike the Old Testament that pretty much ignores eternity and ignores heaven, you get to the New Testament, but it's the New Testament is even worse because the New Testament is full of stuff about heaven and full of stuff about eternity, but it's a bit of a tease. The the, the message of the New Testament when it comes to being good and going to heaven is good luck, you're doomed. I mean, it's the stuff like this. The apostle Paul who who was on, you know, on both sides said, there's no one righteous, not even one, not even you. There, there, there is, look at this, this is worse. There is no one who will be declared righteous or good. That's just the Bible word for good. No one will be declared good or good enough in God's sight by the works of the law or by obeying the law or the 10 commandments or any of the rules that you find in the Bible. And then the one that many of us heard growing up, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The, the point is, I'm not arguing at this point that what the Bible says is true. What I'm arguing is that If you think somewhere in the Bible, there's a standard by which if you live, you'll go to heaven, you are sadly mistaken. And my hunch is you haven't actually read the Bible. The Bible does not provide us with a standard of conduct that guarantees heaven. In fact, it's just the opposite. And again, I'm not arguing that the Bible is correct. That's just what the Bible says. There's no magic list. So the unsettling, the unsettling reality is that we have no established standard, but it gets worse, and I'll go through these quick. The second problem is with the good people go to heaven theory is this. We don't know what percentage of our actions have to be good to make the cut. Is it 70%? I mean, even if we knew what was good, which we don't, but even if we knew what was good, it seems like if God is gonna allow people into heaven based on how good they are, that we should know the percentage. Is it a 70? Is it a 50 And what age does our behavior start to count? Hopefully somewhere past 40. I don't know, you know, when do you you want to start registering the good and the bad, right? And does God take our environment into account? I mean, some people, I had all the advantages in the world being raised in the family I was raised in. I have no excuse. Other people didn't have as many advantages in terms of exposure to church and all that stuff. So does God take our environment into account? I don't know. Number three, it gets worse. We don't know if thoughts and motives count against us. Is it just what we do or is it why we do what we do, right? And then how about this? We could already be out of time and not know it. In other words, you may have already done so many bad things that you don't have enough time to do good things to make up for your bad things and you don't know it. Worse, you don't even know if that's how it works. Is that how it works? Or are there there certain things that are so bad that if you do those bad things, you're out, you're doomed, period, no matter how many good things you do. I don't know. I mean, we kind of have some sense of justice and fairness, but we've just kind of made that up. But you may have done so many bad things, you don't have time to make up for them. You could be doomed and not know it. In other words, you could be being good for nothing. (laughs) You're trying to make up, make up, make up, make up, and God's going, it's too late. Too many bad things. And not even just too many bad things. The type of bad things you did were so bad, there's no way to make up for that. But how do we know? And then I know this, I know you're saying, Andy, this is kind of ridiculous. It is ridiculous. That's my point. You could miss heaven by one good deed. (laughs) Isn't that true? If good people go to heaven somewhere, there's a cutoff, right? And you can miss it by, in other words, you were right on the edge. You were in, if only you had not lost your temper with that customer service agent. And boom, you're out because you did. Right, one infraction could bump you. And then here's the real problem. And, and we could go, we could spend the rest of the time talking about this. I just wanna disturb some of us out of our lethargy and out of our apathy and out of our laziness in terms of giving this thought. But here's the real problem, okay? If good people go to heaven and God never explained how the system works, in other words, if, if 
only good people go to heaven and God never explained how it works, then God is not good by our definition of good. I mean, what do you call a, what do you call a teacher? A, a teacher who doesn't give you any notes, okay? Or any reading assignments, but just a final exam, but doesn't even bother to tell you when the final exam would be. You don't call that a good teacher. You call that a bad teacher. What, what do you call a boss? What do you call a boss, okay? Who evaluates your performance, but never gave you a job description or an explanation of what's expected. What do you call that? Maybe you call that your boss, okay? But you don't call that a good boss, right? Or what about race officials, like a road race, like a running, you know, a road race. What about race officials who don't post any signs about where the course actually is? Who, who don't even announce the distance you're expected to run? Who establish the finish line after the race started? That's not good. That's not fair. That's not just. But if good people go to heaven, that's the situation. God is not good, just, or fair. Or, and some people think this, or God has a very different view of good, just, and fair, which again is what some people believe. But the point is simply this, scratch beneath the surface and the good people somehow go to heaven thing, not only does it make, not make any sense, it falls completely apart. It becomes absurd. Think about it. We are supposed to be good so we can go be with a good God who never defined the terms, who failed to tell us how good is good enough. If God is good and people who believe in God believe God is good, if God is good, he should show up. He really needs to show up every generation and give us an updated version of good because so many things change from generation to generation. He needs to give us an updated version of what's good and what's expected. We need to have like good enough 2022.0, okay? Every few years, God needs to show up and explain to the new generation what it means to be good in this generation with these new temptations and with technology and with everything else going on. Now, this is really important. It's important because how are we supposed to sleep at night? And, and, and you know, put yourself in my situation or some of your situations, what are you supposed to say at funerals? Joe was, <clears throat> Joe was, he was a really good man. Joe was, Joe was good enough for us. <clears throat> I hope he was good enough for heaven. Let's pray to the God who left us spinning in the wind and wondering. Worse, what are we supposed to tell our children? Now, this is really interesting to me. Psychoanalyst um, and author, um, Erica Komisar, um, you've probably never heard of her. I'd never heard of her either until I read this article. It's so interesting. She says, when it comes to your children, you should just lie. Here, here's what she writes. She says, I am often asked by parents, how do I talk to my children about death? How do I talk to my children about death if I don't believe in God or heaven? And my answer, she says, my answer is always the same. You lie. Because the idea, she says, the idea that you simply die and turn to dust may work for some adults. It doesn't work for many adults, by the way. But it does not help children. Belief, even if it's not true, she says, belief in heaven helps them grapple with this tremendous and incomprehensible loss. So this is a big deal. Now, there are, as you know, there are other options to the good people go to heaven theory. There's the God decides theory. I mean, this, this view is God decides. He went, you're in, you're in, you're in. Not because of anything you do. God just, God wills it. He just chooses who he wills and he dooms the rest. Um, then there's the, um, you wouldn't recognize, this is kind of my version, my statement. You wouldn't recognize good if it bit you version, which means we are so depraved that we are deprived of the ability to even recognize what's good and what's not good. So why would God waste his time telling us what's good and what's not good? Because we just are unable, we're so broken to even recognize good or distinguish between good and bad. And to be honest, as some of you know, I like cliffhanger endings to messages sometimes, kind of leave you hanging. Y'all hate it, but I kind of enjoy that. And so I was tempted to actually end the message here. <laughs> I was like, you know, I was considered ending it like this. So what do we do? Don't miss part two and then just close. 
but I decided against it because that's not a, oh yeah, and I was also gonna say, and try not to get dead in the meantime. I was gonna throw that in just for fun. <laughs> but that's not a very fond farewell. So I'll close with this. And this is where we'll pick it up next time. And you won't be surprised that I'm gonna say this, but this is such a big deal, okay? According to Jesus, this is so amazing. And again, please hear me at this point in the series, I'm not arguing that what Jesus said is true. I'm just telling you what Jesus said for just a moment, okay? According to Jesus, regardless of how serious you take Jesus, but if you think somehow Jesus is in the mix of good people go to heaven, according to Jesus, good people don't go to heaven. And Jesus wrote and said more about heaven than pretty much anybody who ever wrote anything about anything religious, honestly. Jesus said good people don't go to heaven. But at the same time, Jesus insisted that his followers be good and do good to each other and to their enemies. Which means, and this is important, that Jesus believed we are capable of recognizing what is good and doing what is good. So the whole idea that we're just too depraved and broken to ever even recognize what's good, Jesus didn't believe that because he instructed his followers to be good and to do good. And he instructed them to be good like their father in heaven, but not so they would go to heaven. And then in the end, you know the story, in the end, the good people in that culture conspired with the bad people in that culture and they crucified him. But Jesus got the final word because from the cross, another famous story from the New Testament, from the cross, (laughs) Jesus said to a very bad man, I will see you on the other side. So Jesus did not teach that good people go to heaven. Jesus taught that different kind of person goes to heaven. We're gonna talk about that next week. He didn't teach that good people go to heaven, but he told us to be good. And he said to be good like our father in heaven, but not so that we would go to heaven. We're just to be good. And if Jesus is who his first century followers claimed he was, that was really good news. For one thing, you don't have to lie to your children. If what Jesus said is true, You can stand at a funeral and celebrate someone's life and someone's goodness. And as the apostle Paul would talk about it so powerful, you can grieve, this is is amazing. You can grieve with hope, but you don't grieve with hope because of the kind of life the deceased lived. You grieve with hope because of what Jesus taught. In my line of work, I've done so many funerals and gravesides. And in most, of, in most occasions, I've been with people who were grieving with hope. But I've been with families and done gravesides where nobody was grieving with hope. They were just grieving because their worldview left them with no hope. Or maybe the hope that he was or she was good enough to make it, but we just don't know and there's no way to know. So this is a big deal. And as we're gonna see, and this is why I'm spending a few weeks talking about this, your heavenly, this is what Jesus instructed us to call God, your heavenly father wants you to know If Jesus was correct, if Jesus was correct, your heavenly father, God, so loved the world that, this is what makes this so amazing, he showed up. He showed up to tell us the way. He showed up to show us the way. And in the end, as most of us have heard, he actually claimed to be the way. Instead of giving us a list, he gave us himself. It's a completely different paradigm. It's a completely different approach. It's why there's hope in the midst of grief. He gave himself. He gave, God gave his one and only son that whoever, and we all know this, you've heard this, whoever behaves like him, 
Whoever is good like him, whoever behaves themselves enough, whoever earns and works and keeps and jumps high enough and ducks low enough. And John, who was there and documented this, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and John, the apostle John, who brought us these words. He said, no, he said, I'm, I'm looking back on the whole story arc of Jesus and his whole life. And John would say, as Peter would say, as you know, all of Jesus' earliest followers would say, hey, we came into this thing thinking we're behaving our way in or hopefully we're related enough to Abraham that we're gonna get in. And we don't even know what in means because in our scripture, the Old Testament, it is very unclear what happens after a person leaves this life. But if there is an afterlife, we're doing our best to earn our way in. And after three and a half or so years with Jesus, John looks back and he says, we had it all wrong. We, we, we were on the, if we're good enough, we'll make it bandwagon. And then, and then we were face to face with, we're convinced God in a body. And we were convinced that God so loved every single person in this world that he didn't send us a list. He sent us a representative of himself that whoever not behaves correctly or behaves enough like him, but whoever believes, places their trust in him, would not be lost to God, would not, our English text says, perish, would not be lost to God, but would have eternal life. And how? Through him. If, If Jesus was correct, God is not in heaven trying to catch us doing bad so he can put a check in a box or take a check out of a box or remove a star from beside our name, however you view that work. And if Jesus is correct, God's not up there trying to catch us in order to condemn us. John said, no, I've seen the whole thing from beginning to end. God, that's what we thought. We thought because there were so many laws and there was so much rule keeping, we're gonna talk about that in two weeks, that we thought somehow God just had this ledger and it just took, kept records and we don't know how it worked, but we knew we had to earn, 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 earn. But after three years with Jesus, God, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Again, how? Through him. So what do we do? Don't miss part two of heaven who goes there because we will pick it up right there next time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for making it clear. Thank you that we have something we can tell our children with confidence. We don't have to lie. We don't have to make things up. Heavenly Father, thank you that if Jesus is correct, we can mourn and grieve with hope. Father, if Jesus is correct, we don't have to wonder and wander. So Father, in this moment, in these next couple of times that we're together, Would you please lift the pressure off of those of us who live with the pressure to somehow please you, to earn our way into something? And Father, for those of us who ping pong back and forth because of our past, and we believe you forgive, but we've done so many things and we just can never find peace with you, would you in these next few moments or in these next few weeks create the space for us to find peace? But wherever this lands with us, would you do that thing that no sermon can do, no preacher can do, no song can do, the thing where you just, ah, now I see. Now I understand. Now I get it. It's too good to be true. But what if it's true? And that we would settle into that place of peace in spite of our past. Peace in spite of our sin. Peace in spite of the fact that there doesn't seem to ever be enough to do to make things right with you. So Father, wherever this lands with us, just give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear and courage to respond in a way that allows you to be for us who you've always wanted to be for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you would please stand with us. Sing along with me. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life into me. Yes, you did. You have been so, so kind to me Still your love thought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me Yes, you did You have been so, so kind to me
You know, we started our time of singing talking about hope. And I want you to leave with real hope today. Hope in knowing that our God is full of reckless love. Love for each and every one of us, regardless of what your story is, regardless of where you're at in your faith journey. He has got reckless, overwhelming love for each and every one of you. So much so that he made a way that we don't have to live with a list. He made a way by sending his son, Jesus. So I want you to be thinking about today's message on the way home, talking about it in the car as you gather in community groups. Questions like, how have you been living? Have you been living trying to be good enough? And if you have, honestly, if you have, how do you know when good enough's good enough? And what do you do with this news? What are you doing with this news that God has made a way in and through his son, Jesus? He is the way. He's the truth. And he's made a way for you to experience life now, the life that you're longing for. And as we're going to be talking about next week, the life eternal as well. So have that conversation. Don't forget next week we're doing the food drive. You can also be registering to serve at World Vision and with many of our local nonprofit partners. So keep an eye on your email inbox. Bring those food items with you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, stay connected with us on social media. Have great conversations. And we look forward to continuing this series with you then. Go in peace.